it is just merely asserted from the religious point of view that three-day-old human embryos have souls. You have souls in the Petri dish, you have souls in the little girl with diabetes, you can't, you know, the interest of, uh, who can weigh the interest of one soul against another? You just have to respect the faith proposition that life starts at the moment of conception, whatever that means. Well, let's talk about the details for a second. Perhaps it sounds scary to destroy human embryos. A, a three-day-old human embryo is a collection of 150 cells. They're arranged in a sphere. There's no brain. There's no nervous system. Maybe 150 cells sounds like a lot of cells. There are 100,000 cells in the brain of a fly. Flies have brains. They have neurons. They have neurons very much like our own. If we know anything at all about the relationship between physical complexity and the, and, the, and the possibility of having experience, and the possibility of having interests, we know that more suffering is visited upon this earth every time we swat a fly than when we kill a three-day-old human embryo. It's not enough to say they're potential human beings. You know, given given the, the advances in genetic engineering, Every cell in the human body with a nucleus is a potential human being given the right manipulation. Every time the, the president scratches his nose, he's engaged in a holocaust of potential human beings. Uh, I'd like to take a, a moment, as many people have, to just acknowledge the void that is left by the death of our friend Hitch. While it, it might be possible to guess what he would have thought about a number of the topics raised here, it's almost impossible to imagine how well he would have expressed those thoughts. Uh, I mean, the man had more wit and style and substance than a few civilizations I could name. <laughs> To not believe in God is to know that it falls to us to make the world a better place. We have barely emerged from centuries of, of barbarism. It's not, it's not a surprise that there are shocking inequities in this world. It, it is hard work to, to climb down out of the trees, walk upright, and build a viable global civilization when you, when you start with technology that's made of rocks and sticks and fur. And this, is, this, is, this is a project, and, and progress is difficult. Just, just picture going back a hundred generations within your own family. I mean, just picture, picture it kind of mapped onto this room, maybe this, this front row. Just a hundred people. Your father's fathers, mother's fathers, mother's fathers, fathers, on back. Now, I don't care how cultured you are, what, how well-educated your family. You can be Matthew Chapman, whose great-great-grandfather was Charles Darwin. But if you just keep going, in no more than a hundred conversations, you are going to meet someone who thinks that sacrificing your firstborn child just might be a good way to control the weather. It, we, it is, some of you probably don't have to go back quite that far. <laughs> You just have to go home for Christmas. <laughs> Many people claim to find it impossible to believe or to imagine that they won't exist after death. Um, just try it for a second. I mean, you, you imagine that everyone in Paris right now is getting along fine without all of us. I mean, none of us are in Paris. We are really, really materially absent from whatever is going on in every other city on this planet right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you were absent for all of human history before your birth. Uh, the idea that you, that you simply can't imagine not existing after death is really kind of a, just for lack of trying, I think. <laughs> the deeper point here, and this is where the whole style uh, and content of what you're saying is so deeply unscientific, is that there's not, a, there's not a physicist sitting on this stage right now. Okay, I would never be tempted to lecture a room full of a thousand people at Caltech about physics. I'm not a physicist. You're not a physicist. And, and, and basically every sentence demonstrates that, that you speak on the subject. Now, nine million children die every year before they reach the age of five. 
Okay, picture picture a, a, an Asian tsunami of the sort we saw in 2004 that killed a quarter of a million people. One of those every 10 days killing children only under five. Okay, it's 20, 24,000 children a day, 1,000 an hour, 17 or so a minute. That means before I can get to the end of this sentence, some few children, very likely, will have died in terror and agony. Okay, think, think of the parents of these children. Think of the fact that, that most of these men and women believe in God and are praying at this moment for their children to be spared and their prayers will not be answered. Okay, but according to Dr. Craig, this is all part of God's plan. Any God who would allow children by the millions to suffer and die in this way, and their parents to grieve in this way, either can do nothing to help them, or doesn't care to. He is therefore either impotent or evil. And worse than that, on Dr. Craig's view, most of these people, many of these people certainly, will be going to hell because they're praying to the wrong God. Just think about that. Okay, through no fault of their own, they were born into the wrong culture where they got the wrong theology and they missed the revelation. Okay, there, there are 1.2 billion people in India at this moment. Most of them are Hindus, most of them therefore polytheists. Okay, in Dr. Craig's universe, no matter how good these people are, they are doomed. If you are, if you are praying to the monkey god Hanuman, you are doomed. Okay. You will be tortured in hell for eternity. Now, is there the slightest evidence for this? No. It just says so in Mark 9 and Matthew 13 and Revelation 14. Okay. So God created the cultural isolation of the Hindus. Okay. He engineered the circumstance of their deaths in ignorance of revelation. And then he created the penalty for this ignorance, which is an eternity of conscious torment in fire. Okay. On the other hand, on Dr. Craig's account, your run-of-the-mill serial killer in America, okay, who, who spent his life raping and torturing children, need only come to God, come to Jesus on death row, and after a final meal of fried chicken, he's going to spend an eternity in heaven after death. Okay. One thing should be crystal clear to you. This vision of life has absolutely nothing to do with moral accountability. Okay. And please notice the double standard that people like Dr. Craig use to, to exonerate God from all this evil. Okay, we're told that God is loving and kind and just and intrinsically good. But when someone like myself points out the rather obvious and compelling evidence that God is cruel and unjust because he visits suffering on innocent people of a scope and scale that would, would embarrass the most ambitious psychopath, okay, we're told that God is mysterious. Okay, who can understand God's will? Okay, and yet this is precisely... This merely human understanding of God's will is precisely what believers use to establish his goodness in the first place. You know, something good happens to a Christian. Some, he feels some bliss while praying, say, or he sees some positive change in his life, and we're told that God is good. Okay, but when children by the tens of thousands are torn from their parents' arms and drowned, we're told that God is mysterious. This is how you play tennis without the net. Okay, and I want to suggest to you that it is not only tiresome when otherwise intelligent people speak this way, it is morally reprehensible. Okay, this kind of faith is, is really is the perfection of narcissism. I mean, God loves me, don't you know? He, he cured me of my eczema. He, he makes me feel so good while singing in church. And, and just when we had given up hope, he found a banker who was willing to reduce my mother's mortgage. Okay. Given all, the, all that this God of yours does not accomplish in the lives of others, given, given the, the misery that's being imposed on some helpless child at this instant, this kind of faith is obscene. 
Okay, this, to think in this way is to fail to reason honestly or to care sufficiently about the suffering of other human beings. And if God is good and loving and just and kind, and he wanted to guide us morally with a book, why give us a book that supports slavery? Why give us a book that admonishes us to kill people for imaginary crimes like witchcraft? Now, of course, there's a way of not taking these questions to heart. Okay, according to Dr. Craig's divine command theory, God is not bound by moral duties. God doesn't have to be good. Whatever he commands is good. So when he commands that the Israelites to slaughter the Amalekites, that behavior becomes intrinsically good because he commanded it. Okay, well, here we're being offered, I'm glad he raised the issue of psychopathy, we're being offered a psychopathic and psychotic moral attitude. It's psychotic because this is completely delusional. There's no reason to believe that we live in a universe ruled by an invisible monster, Yahweh. But it is, it is psychopathic because this is a total detachment from the, from the well-being of human beings. It, this so easily rationalizes the slaughter of children. Okay, just, th just think about the Muslims at this moment who are blowing themselves up, okay, convinced that they are agents of God's will. There is absolutely nothing that Dr. Craig can, can say against their behavior in moral terms, apart from his own faith-based claim that they're praying to the wrong God. Okay, if they had the right God, what they were doing would be good on divine command theory. Now, I'm obviously not saying that all that Dr. Craig or all religious people are psychopaths and psychotics, but this to me is the, is the true horror of religion. Okay, it allows perfectly decent and sane people to believe by the billions what only lunatics could believe on their own. Okay, if you wake up tomorrow morning thinking that saying a few Latin words over your pancakes is going to turn them into the body of Elvis Presley, okay, you have lost your mind. Okay. But if you think more or less the same thing about a cracker and the body of Jesus, you're just a Catholic. <laughs> and I'm not the first person to notice that it's a, it's a very strange sort of loving God who would make salvation depend on believing in him on bad evidence. Okay. It's, it's, I mean, if you lived... 2,000 years ago, there was evidence galore. I mean, he was just performing miracles, but apparently he got tired of being so helpful. Okay, and so now we, we all inherit this very heavy burden of the doctrine's implausibility and, 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 and the effort to square it with what we now know about the cosmos and, we, and what we know about the all too human origins of scripture becomes more and more difficult. And, and, and it's not just the generic God that Dr. Craig is recommending. It is, is God the Father and Jesus the Son. Okay, Christianity, on Dr. Craig's account, is the true moral wealth of the world. Well, I, I hate to break it to you here at Notre Dame, but Christianity is a cult of human sacrifice. Okay, Christianity is not a religion that, sell, that, that, that repudi repudiates human sacrifice. It is a religion that celebrates a single human sacrifice as though it were effective. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, John 3.16. Okay, the idea is that, that Jesus suffered the crucifixion so that none need suffer hell, except for those, those billions in India and billions like them throughout history. Okay, this is, this is, this is a stride. This doctrine is a stride a contemptible history of scientific ignorance and religious barbarism. We, we come from people who used to bury children in, under the foundations of new buildings as offerings to their imaginary gods. I mean, just think about that. There, in, in vast numbers of societies, people would bury children in post holes, people like ourselves thinking that this would prevent an invisible being from knocking down their buildings. These are the sorts of people who wrote the Bible. Okay, if there is a, a, a less moral, moral framework than the one Dr. Craig is proposing, I haven't heard of it.
It's true that some people define God as pure consciousness or as being synonymous with the laws of nature. Uh, but if we talk about consciousness and the laws of nature, we won't be talking about the God that most of our neighbors believe in, which is a personal God who hears our prayers and occasionally answers them. So I just want you to be sensitive to this, because if Michael or I say something derogatory about Islam or Christianity, which seems possible, <laughs> uh, the, the response from the other side shouldn't mention quantum mechanics. And, and, it, and it shouldn't reference a, a, a notion of God that is so denuded of doctrine as to more or less be synonymous with pure mystery or pure information or pure energy or pure anything. Um, so I just want to, I wanted to plant a flag there where you all can see it. Because, because the God that our neighbors believe in is essentially an invisible person. He is a creator deity who created the universe to have a relationship with one species of primate. Lucky us. <laughs> and and he, he's, got, he's got galaxy upon galaxy to attend to, but he's especially concerned with what we do, and, and he's especially concerned with what we do while naked. <laughs> and he, he almost certainly disapproves of homosexuality. And he's created this, this cosmos as a vast laboratory in which to test our powers of credulity. And the test is this. Can you believe in this God on bad evidence? Which is to say on faith. And, and if you can, you will win an eternity of happiness after you die. And it's precisely this sort of God and this sort of scheme that you must believe in if you're going to have a, a, any kind of future in politics in this country, no matter what your gifts, I mean, you could be, you could be an, an unprecedented genius, you could look like George Clooney, you could have a billion dollars, and you could have the social skills of Oprah, and you are going nowhere in politics in this country unless you believe in that sort of God. What scientific proof or evidence of any sort can you muster to support your assertion that there is for lack of a better term, God, or some sort of intelligence at the heart of the universe? Okay, what scientific proof? I think science is, and again, in deference to Sam Harris, he said, don't go the way of quantum physics. I think I'm going to have to say that science is now in a process of overthrowing the climactic overthrow of the superstition of materialism. That everything that we call matter comes from something that is not material. That the essential nature of the physical world is that it's not physical. That the essential stuff of the universe is not stuff. Call it what you will. And science also tells us, and if there are any scientists who want to disagree with them, please come up during the question and our answer session. Science tells us that nature is a discontinuity, that it's an on-off phenomenon that there are gaps between every two ons where you find a field of possibilities, a field of pure potentiality. Science doesn't call it God, but what is God if not the immeasurable potential of all that was, all that is, and all that will be. Science also tells us that this is a field of non-locality where everything is correlated with everything else. My uh, adversaries are going to point out no, no, everything. God is explained by neurology. Well, I hope today, Michael, that you will convert from a skeptic to a neuroskeptic. Because your science is really frozen in the dungeons of conservatism and in the dungeons of orthodoxy. Today, science tells us that uh, the essential nature of reality is non-local correlation. Everything is connected to everything else that there's hidden creativity, there are quantum leaps of creativity, that there's something called the observer effect, where intention orchestrates space-time events, which we then measure as movement and motion and energy and matter. And addressing Sam, we can have a personal relationship 
with this intelligence because we have a consciousness that is part of the sea of consciousness. Rumi, the great Sufi poet said, you're not just a drop in the ocean, you're the mighty ocean in the drop. And all you have to do is understand the principles of science and understand that you have within you the resources to intuitively grasp this mystery. But one of the things we have to do today... Did you hear anything in there that convinces you? Um, <laughs> you asked, uh, Dan, what I meant by woo-woo. That is the very embodiment of woo-woo. He said... Stringing together at, at a rapid patter of a bunch of scientific sounding words sprinkled in with some spiritual new age words is, doesn't mean anything. I mean, just take just one, one, one example of this non-local quantum effects, we're all connected. No, this is not true. When quantum physicists talk about non-locality and the interconnectedness of things, they're talking about things at the quantum level. Wait, well, hold, let me just stop you for a second, yeah. because I, I will play the dummy tonight, because it's not a hard role for me to assume. Uh, what does non-local mean? What, uh, I don't, I mean, I kind of understand what quantum physics means, but just give it to me really simple. Okay. There's this very simple two-slit experiment where you fire these photons through, and uh, if, if you just have two streams of light, they form a, a, a little interference wave pattern, like throwing two rocks in a You've pond. You've already confused. Okay. And, and so it... Yeah, you want to... Interrupt. He's getting into the woo woo now. No, no, this is just... You have, Okay, non, lo, non what he means by non, guys with woo -woo. what he means by non-local, what he means by non-local is that everything in the universe is interconnected, and it, it just is not true. It, it just isn't. And and there's no reason to think that it's active at the level of the brain. Non-locality is a principle that is working. But hold on, Deepak, you, you spoke for quite some time. The, the deeper point to make here, and, and what but is? But I want to address that okay. brain thing that you but, just said. Okay, let's, let's no, 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 no you, you might not have to because. The deeper point here, and this is where the whole style uh, and content of what you're saying is so deeply unscientific, is that there's not, a, there's not a physicist sitting on this stage right now. Okay, I would never be tempted to lecture a room full of a thousand people at Caltech about physics. I'm not a physicist. You're not a physicist. And, and, and basically every sentence demonstrates that, that you speak on the subject. Now. Now, and, and it, please, please don't take this as an ad hominem. I mean, this is, I'm talking about specifically what you said. But the fact, what, what you do and what many people who try to invoke spooky physics do in, in the service of, of propping up their religious and, and new age intuitions, is that they, they think that because, because what you're saying, because, because, what, because quantum mechanics is, is spooky and difficult to understand, and because what you're saying is spooky and difficult to understand, they must somehow be related, or they must somehow be mutually supportive. And that's just fundamentally not true. They are arrived at by completely different methodologies and ways of thinking and criteria of, of discursive evidence. Uh, what, you, what a mystic, you know, I've studied with great mystics. I, I've met great meditation masters who've spent 20 years in caves perfecting the kinds of techniques of meditation that you would, you would adopt or recommend. Um, they don't know a damn thing about physics. And they're not interested, for the most part, in physics. I mean, there's nothing about sitting in a cave and, and granted, having incredibly useful and, and even normative experiences and transforming your way of life and transforming your moment-to-moment -moment perception of the world. There's nothing about that project that makes you a, a theoretical physicist. Uh, and so these are completely different language games. They're completely... And you have just... Uh, merge them together in a very unprincipled way. And you're getting well, the, the, I take resentment at your questioning my scientific credentials. In fact, if anyone on this stage is more scientifically credentialed, it's me. I took physics, chemistry, biology. I'm an MD. I'm a neuroendocrinologist. And I want to object We've to your saying the brain does not biology. obey non-locality. You know, when you right now, when you're thinking right now, uh, 100 trillion neurons are phase locking and frequency locking in simultaneously. Is that non-locality okay, no, non or not? Okay, I, can, I, can I just have... Can I, can I just... I just want to quote from Einstein. Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. From Stephen Hawking. 
it would be very difficult to explain why the universe would have begun in just this way, except as the act of a god who intended to create beings like us. But Hawking's please, an atheist. Please using look this up is those a direct poets. quote. I, I, so what? He, say, he has stated, Hawking has stated on this very stage, he does not believe in God. Well, he doesn't kind of believe in the dead white male that you're talking about, the straw man that you have put up, or the, or the mythical god that Sam Harris is talking the about. The you put up is a meaningless, non-local god. No, I mean? just said, this is also the god that gives us inspiration, insight, creativity, free will, conscious choice making, imagination. Are your neurons doing that or are you doing that? Uh, it's just a, a, a point of process here. Well, you then just, you're a zombie. you dial it down just a, a little bit? Um, first of all, I invite everyone to look up that Einstein quote in Ideas and Opinions. Read it in context. It'll be absolutely obvious. It doesn't, it can't be pressed into the service that you just witnessed. Um, Einstein complained about this treatment of, of his, his metaphorical use of the word God and, and, and his, the few things he said about religion. Uh, and you can look that up in, in Richard Dawkins' book. Um, this is a game. Uh, and it's a game that is, that is designed for export to people who don't know much science and don't know how science is, is done. And, there, and you, you missed the point. Of, I, mean, I wasn't criticizing your scientific credentials. You're an endocrinologist. You're an MD. You're not a, a theoretical physicist. That, that, I mean, the, the way science is done is I when... I invite when theoretical a, physicists in this audience to actually address these oh, questions. Okay, so a theoretical physicist will be, co will be comfortable talking with, with real confidence in a very narrow band of his expertise, and he will be exquisitely sensitive to the fact that when he's in a room like this... Or she. Or she, sorry. Um, I'll just proceed with he just for simplicity's sake here. Um, he will be ex exquisitely sensitive to the fact that whenever he opens his mouth in a room like this, he is guaranteed to be speaking in front of half a dozen people who know more on any given issue than he does. The, the great irony of, of the popular conception of sci science as arrogant is that when you go to a scientific meeting, you, you, don't, you don't see arrogance. I mean, you're, you're about as likely to see real arrogance as you're likely to see nudity at a scientific conference. I mean, this is, this is people are constantly uh, offering caveats and hedges toward what they say. They, 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 every, every statement is couched in, I'm sure there's someone in the room who knows more about this than me, but because everyone is desperate to avoid public embarrassment. Now, this seems to be something you're not uh, <laughs> doing. Uh, so much about our minds, so much about the, the, uh, what, we, what we feel as meaning and value uh, that, that is a result of our entanglement with others. It's, so it's, it's, not that, it's not that if we understood ourselves uh, uh, perfectly at the level of the brain, the result would be a total diminishment in, in uh, uh, our view of ourselves as, as uh, wondrous uh, and wondrously made. I mean, I think it would, it would be, um, in some sense, it exalts our circumstance. And it would give us, whatever is true about us ultimately, it would give us a power to, to change our circumstance in ways that, that uh, benefit us. I mean, we, you know, people want to be happier. People want to be uh, less burdened by unnecessary psychological suffering. How can we bring that about? Is, is delusion the only remedy? Uh, it's a, de delusion has its place. I mean, delusion actually works for some people some of the time, but it actually, it's not, it is a fragile remedy. You know, reality intrudes, and then your delusions are, are no longer helping you. And so it seems to me that, that we're continually going to be in a better position to figure out how to be happy together and to, figure, and, and to see that our collaboration with one another is not zero sum. I mean, it's not like my happiness is predicated on your losing happiness. Um, for the most part, as human beings, but our happiness is predicated on, on us recognizing more and more of the time that we have a common project. Um, and uh, it seems to me that one of the challenges of science is to figure out how to, uh, to focus us on, the, on that 
common project with the least amount of friction, with the least amount of, of unnecessary, divisive, sectarian, um, uh, loss of resources, essentially. And when you look at the difference between science and religion in the way they break down or fail to break down uh, boundaries between people, uh, I mean, science is, is the greatest uh, uh, force for the removal of conversational barriers we have ever hit upon. I mean, there is no such thing as American science versus Japanese science. There's no such thing as Jewish science versus Hindu science. I mean, there, there is, there is, there is just science, um, and uh, there ha at some level that that has to be true of ideas generally. It has to be true of the ideas that that uh, cash out our our moral intuitions and um, uh, our deepest goals in life. So, what's the the mission statement of the Reason Project, which you're just starting, just in a well, very briefly. Yeah, it really is along these lines. It's, it's yeah. the goal is to spread uh, secular thinking and scientific knowledge in society, and to do that in a very multidisciplinary way. I mean, to do it in in terms of organizing conferences and 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 uh, funding scientific research, but also to create uh, documentaries and and uh, media events. Um, and we have a very diverse board from, from scientists like Steven Weinberg to entertainers like, like Bill Maher and, and uh, writers like Ian McEwan and Salman Rushdie. I mean, I, my, my image is this is a problem of, of transforming the way people think about uh, the human project and, and uh, transforming the, the kind of expectations we have of our neighbors uh, uh, for making sense in public discourse, and so I, I see a role for um, business and and uh, entertainment, and also you know hard you know laboratory scholarship to come at this from all angles, because we we all have to start talking the talk uh, from all sides very quickly here. It seems to me. So what 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 are the most um, salient mistakes you've made, and what did you learn from them? Well, I didn't learn much because one salient mistake was to talk about MDMA in an interview. <laughs> so yes, I had an interview with the um, the LA Times, and it was on track to be a you know your standard interview. And and the mention of MDMA became uh, it became the atheist has mo his mind blown on MDMA interview. Right. Uh, so don't do that again. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I'm glad you glad yes, you avoided you doing can, that yeah, again. Yeah, you can see. It was, it was really <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think it's, I mean, it's going, it's going well. I mean, there's many things I would, I would probably, I could rethink, but I'm very grateful for how it has unfolded. And I've, you know, I've, I feel like I've done everything in the wrong order. You know, I've, I've, um, you know, I published two books before I finished my PhD, and I mean, it's sort of—it's a weird, you know, I'm in a that's, weird that's position. That's what your advisor said to yeah. me as well. <laughs> right. <You know. laughs> um, so, you know, there's, there's clearly a better way to, uh, and a more efficient way to do some of these things, but it's—I uh, can't really complain. Mm -hmm. um, ask yourselves, what is wrong with spending eternity in hell? Well, I, I'm told it's rather hot there, for one. Dr. Craig is not offering an alternative view of morality. Okay, the whole point of Christianity, or so it is imagined, is to safeguard the eternal well-being of human souls. This, I just want to kind of show you all how the sausage of faith gets made. Uh, <laughs> or at least, at least uh, argued for. Um, to, I see two problems with what you just did, and okay. um, perhaps you're aware of them. <laughs> uh, one is that Maimonides actually said that this could not be understood allegorically or in any other right. way, but literally he came right. back 25 years later after he had been misunderstood in the Guide to the Perplexed and wrote, in a, in, I think in his commentary to the Mishnah, that, this, that the resurrection is a literal truth, has to be believed in. Um, 
there may be some, some caveats there uh, in his yes. theology, but he was talking right. about bodies being right. re reanimated. Um, the other issue is you made this sort of artful move to the free will loophole. You said people have free will. If a man wants to lock his daughter in a dungeon and have sex with her, God has allowed that because he's given us uh, this uh, rather diabolical freedom. Um, that doesn't cover all of the other suffering for, for, who, for which only God can be responsible if he exists. The nine I million children right. I, agree I just talked about yes. dying every year. Yep. Through, through cancers and violence uh, and accidents and, and uh, lack of access to clean water. And um, this, is, this is God's fault if God exists. I mean, either he, is, either he can do nothing about this or he doesn't care to. So either he's impotent or evil. I mean, this is the, this is the problem that, you can't, that the free will doesn't right. get you out of. This meeting that was organized by John Meacham of Newsweek uh, where they were just, you know, do, ask questions like, do you uh, experience the Holy Spirit? You know, and, and Hillary Clinton was led to say in that context that you know, the, the, the tear she shed in a New Hampshire diner was evidence of the Holy Spirit uh, I mean, and, and received no opposition from anybody. I mean, this was just, the, you know, like, what kind of epistemology do we have where Hillary Clinton can get away with that? Um, so I, I mean, that's the situation we're in. It, it, it's a complete vacuum of critical intelligence. When, Pete, when, when the conversation turns to, to God talk. Yeah, right. I'd like to ask a question about a place where there ought to be a uh, presence of um, critical reason, which is Christian apologetics. So there's a long Catholic tradition and a um, shorter uh, Protestant tradition um, of Christian apologetics. And I'm, I'm wondering what your views are on that. Um, and. I assume you think that they've gone badly awry, and how did they manage to do it when supposedly they were using reason to um, underpin their faith? Well, it's, the problem is just, are you going to hold certain claims off the table when you start playing the reason game? And uh, it seems to me that most Christians, who you know, many very smart, intellectually sophisticated Christians, you know, from Aquinas on down, can play a, a, a language game uh, that is a, certainly attempts to be self-consistent and has all of the features of, of rational discourse that we admire, but it's in the context of we're going to take as axiomatic the fact that the, 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 the Bible was the sacred word of the creator of the universe. You know, so how do we square you know, the evidence of uh, paleontology and all the rest with the fact that the Bible is the word of God and Jesus is his son and rose from the dead on the third day. That's the, that's the game that most Christians are playing. Uh, the Bible is never put in play. You know, we, 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 never, we never see Christians looking, I mean, they, we don't see this because they, cease, they tend to cease to be Christians if they actually do this. They never see them looking at the fossil record and at, at um, the wealth of evidence for, of, of um, for evolution coming from molecular biology and, and uh, um, the distribution of, of uh, animals uh, uh, across the Earth's surface. We, they never look at those facts and then come back to the Bible and say, well, what's given that this is the way the world is? What's the likelihood that an omniscient being described it this way? You know, I mean, this is then the Bible just falls apart. I mean, it's, the Bible is. is not even close to being something that we should admire as a as a um, um, kind of a a, a, man, a manual for this for, for existence in this place, um, and so too with morality. I mean, given what we now expect of, of our fellow human beings, you know what you know, gender equality and and. Uh, uh, repudiation of slavery, and uh, you know, and now that we have people like you know, uh, John Rawls and Thomas Nagel and and Derek Parfit really thinking clearly about ethical problems, you know, and not not that they all agree, but I mean, now that we know what it's like to really parse ethical issues, now let's look at the Bible and see, let's look at Leviticus and see just what God was up to. It's an embarrassment, you know. It's just you can't. You, how could you do it with a straight face? 
it's not like there was nothing good in there, but I mean, it, things have gotten so much better. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's what you keep off the table. And, and it's useful to point out that Muslims are able to do their reason game and it's, it's nullifying of Christianity. I mean, they have their whole story about why Jesus could not be the Son of God. Um, you know, that's right there. That's, you know, those, are, those are mutually incompatible worldviews, and they're, they're playing the same, the same game. He engineered the circumstance of their deaths in ignorance of revelation. And then he created the penalty for this ignorance, which is an eternity of conscious torment in fire. Okay, on the other hand, on Dr. Craig's account, your run-of-the-mill serial killer in America, okay, who, who spent his life raping and torturing children, need only come to God, come to Jesus on death row. And after a final meal of fried chicken, he's going to spend an eternity in heaven after death. Okay, one thing should be crystal clear to you. This vision of life has absolutely nothing to do with moral accountability. Okay, and please notice the double standard that people like Dr. Craig use to, to exonerate God from all this evil. Okay, we're told that God is loving and kind and just and intrinsically good. But when someone like myself points out the ob rather obvious and compelling evidence that God is cruel and unjust because he visits suffering on innocent people of a scope and scale that would, would embarrass the most ambitious psychopath, okay, we're told that God is mysterious. Okay, who can understand God's will? You know, something good happens to a Christian. Some, he feels some bliss while praying, say, or he sees some positive change in his life, and we're told that God is good. Okay, but when children by the tens of thousands are torn from their parents' arms and drowned, we're told that God is mysterious. Okay, this is how you play tennis without the net. Okay, and I want to suggest to you that it is not only tiresome when otherwise intelligent people speak this way. It is morally reprehensible. This kind of faith is, is really is the perfection of narcissism. I mean, God loves me, don't you know? He, he cured me of my eczema. Given, given the, the misery that's being imposed on some helpless child at this instant, this kind of faith is obscene. Okay, this, to think in this way is to fail to reason honestly or to care sufficiently about the suffering of other human beings. We're being offered a psychopathic and psychotic moral attitude. It's psychotic because this is completely delusional. There's no reason to believe that we live in a universe ruled by an invisible monster, Yahweh. But it is, it is psychopathic because this is a total detachment from, from the well-being of human beings. It, this so easily rationalizes the slaughter of children. Okay, it allows perfectly decent and sane people to believe by the billions what only lunatics could believe on their own. Well, I actually never used the word atheist in the end of faith. And I never thought to not use it. I, I simply didn't think of myself as an atheist. Uh, I didn't use the word, I mean, I, in the same way that I don't think of myself as a non-astrologer. You know, I don't, no one has to wake up in the morning and repudiate <coughs> astrologer, uh, astrology by accepting the identity as a non-astrologer. Uh, and there's no one who, who you know, n virtually no one believes in Zeus, and we haven't defined ourselves in opposition to paganism. We're not non-pagans. Um, and I think it's also useful to point out that every devout Christian stands in the same relationship to Hinduism or to, to Islam as I do. I mean, the Christians look at what's going on in, in Muslim discourse. They look at the claim that the Quran is the perfect word of the creator of the universe, and they are not persuaded. And that's all, that's all my atheism consists of. I'm not persuaded by these patently ridiculous claims. And I am persuaded by the evidence that these people are part of a, a culture 
that is designed to uh, not look critically at its own discourse. Uh, and so Christians can see that of Islam. They can point out the errors of thinking there. They just don't point it out in Christianity. Um, so the, from my point of view, I, I don't think this is where I may differ from some of my colleagues. I, I don't think the word atheism ultimately is, is necessary or even useful. And I think it's actually, uh, in the end, harmful. Uh, because it, it uh, re the rejection of absurdity is much bigger than atheism. I mean, it, it is science. You know, it, reason is much bigger than atheism. And having standards of evidence and argument is much bigger than atheism. And that's all we need to repudiate most of what, peop what most people do most of the time in the name of, of religion. I mean, really, uh, on my uh, account, relig religious faith is really the permission people give one another to believe things strongly without evidence. And we recognize that to be pathological in every other area of our lives. We just, we simply have been lulled into thinking that the game must change when you talk about meaning and values and morality and what happens after death. And I think that is, uh, we're paying the price for that in, in rather astonishing ways. Yeah, you said a, a belief is a lever that once pulled, lever, lever that once pulled moves almost everything else in a person's life. It, so insofar as it's actually believed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there, and this is, a, again, there, there's a difference between professing a belief and really believing what you profess. And, and, and we have to acknowledge that. I mean, the, the, the poll results that, that are almost all we have to go on are astonishing. The fact that 71% that of Americans believe Satan literally exists and, and leads people to sin. Uh, the, the similar number thinks Jesus is going to return physically uh, and um, rapture all the good people. The, the fact that it can't be that 71% really, really believe these things, uh, but some significant percentage do. And so, the, but the distance between what people profess and what actually moves them moment to moment in their lives, um, it, we just have to acknowledge that it's there, and we're more concerned about the people who, who really are making decisions on the basis of a notion that prayer works. For instance, I mean, you take the the, the current. Uh, uh, nominee for the vice presidency in the Republican ticket, Sarah Palin. Now what, just what does she believe about the efficacy of prayer? Uh, it really matters. If she believes that it works on any level, that seems to me to be a bad thing. When it comes time to decide when to go to war or not to go to war. Uh, and I think many, Amer many, many Americans clearly believe that it works on some level. And, and we know a lot about the way they they cherry pick evidence uh, and the kinds of selection biases that allow them to, in their own lives and in reading the newspaper, come to believe that prayer is working. Um, but we know it doesn't work. You know, you know, Hurricane Katrina came in and wiped out uh, a community, 90% of whom believe in the power of prayer. And after this devastation, people were polled asking whether this only confirmed their belief in God. Uh, and 89% of people said their belief in God went up as a result. It's a, it, it, it's a, um, it's a kind of credence uh, that is so elastic that it, it's, it's, it, it, it will suffer any possible collision with reality uh, if we don't point these, these contradictions out. And that's, that's really the problem that worries me the most, is that even people who don't believe these things have been collaborating in this conspiracy to keep people living and speaking and reasoning as though all of these beliefs were justified. Um, and so we have atheist scientists keeping uh, religious people safe in their, their, their sanctum sanctorum of, of, of wishful thinking uh, because they think Everyone else needs this stuff. You know, I, the atheist scientist, don't need this stuff. But these poor people, they've got nothing else. Most scientists actually espouse a view like that, whether or not they have any religious beliefs themselves. And it's, it's profoundly condescending and, and unimaginative. And it's actually uh, uh, coming at quite a cost to us, I think, culturally. So what about the issue of religious scientists, then? 
Well, it's one thing to, to acknowledge, and this is um, part of the power of cultural context, is that it's a, almost uniquely an American problem. And if you, look at the, if you look at the rates of belief among scientists in the U.S. versus the U.K., they're skewed by this, basically the, the American propensity uh, for religious belief to a, to a great degree. Uh, it's, it's also worth pointing out that science, even in America, really does knock down religious belief uh, considerably. I mean, we have 90% of people uh, believing in God in the general population and 40% of scientists. Um, and depending on what your scientific specialization is, it, it gets knocked down further. Uh, doctors, 60% of doctors uh, believe in, in God uh, of some form. Uh, and I think that's, it's not an accident that doctors are the most full of faith because the doctors are having to deal with, with people who are dying, who are confronting their mortality in the context of their own faith. And it's, it's, um, it's got to be easier in some way emotionally to meet them in that language game uh, in some way that's appro that seems appropriate to their uh, circumstance. And that's, you know, that the burden is upon the secular reasonable person, uh, the atheist, to find a way of, of dealing with those moments, the, the, you know, the, a moment of, of uh, uh, someone dying in a hospital, say, uh, with, without 